Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Annual Legislative Conference and this particular uh, session on the activist athlete. It's an honor uh, and a privilege for me uh, to serve the people of the 8th Congressional District uh, in the United States Congress and uh, to help convene uh, such a tremendous panel of individuals who will be appropriately uh, introduced shortly uh, for such a time as this, where we all across black America have come uh, here to Washington, D.C. In many ways, we've come here to get in the huddle, to develop uh, some plays, uh, and then to go back out onto the playing field and execute on behalf of the communities uh, that we represent. I think all of you know uh, these are certainly very challenging times uh, that we're living through at this moment. You know, hurricanes down in the Caribbean, earthquakes in Mexico, wildfires in California, and a man-made disaster here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Just a few blocks away. Like someone said to me the other day, they said, Congressman, you know, do you miss Barack Obama? I said, I will always miss the great Barack Obama. But this current president is so out of control, I'm starting to miss George W. Bush as well. <laughs> so these are challenging times. But we know that our community, in terms of our entire journey here in America, has been through a lot of adversity. And through that adversity, particularly throughout the last century into this one, whether that was around the Civil Rights Movement and fighting back against the Jim Crow era, the mass incarceration, the police brutality that we continue to deal with. Through all of that, the black athlete has always played a meaningful role. In my hometown of Brooklyn, New York, we know that on April 15, 1947, Jackie Robinson at Ebbets Field became the first African American to play in a baseball game at the major league level and shattered the color barrier in America's pastime. It wasn't just meaningful in terms of what happened for baseball, it actually helped to usher in the modern day civil rights movement because it occurred before the Brown v. Board of Education decision in 1954. It occurred before the great Rosa Parks sat down on that bus in Montgomery, Alabama in 1956. It occurred before the March on Washington and all of the things that took place in the 1960s. Jackie Robinson shattering the color barrier in America's pastime. And we know Muhammad Ali, the great boxer, stood up so courageously against the unjust Vietnam War and athletes like Jim Brown and Bill Russell and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played meaningful roles in the 1960s into the 1970s, all the way through Colin Kaepernick's courageous stand, pushing back against the police violence epidemic. The black athlete has, in the view of many of us, a meaningful role to play. And so to explore that, we've got a tremendous panel uh, and a tremendous moderator who really needs no introduction. He's a prolific author and commentator, a syndicated uh, writer, the dynamic host of News One Now, and I think it's fair to say the authentic, unapologetic, journalistic voice of black America, Roland Martin. All right, glad to be here and glad to have uh, this conversation. Glad all of you are here. All right.
in a chair. Uh, and so folks in the back and on the side, you can certainly take one of these seats. Uh, it's all good uh, for, and so that way those who do come in, then they can just line up all over here. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. First and foremost, uh, uh, we're gonna just behave yourselves accordingly. Uh, we are recording this audio and video. Uh, Congressman Jeffries is smart. He said it is a guaranteed way his panel will get on TV One, and that is invite the host of the show. That's a smart man. It's some other members of Congress mad right now that they didn't respond to my text message, and they're like, why is my panel not on the show? Because I ain't moderating it. Uh, and so, smart man, Congressman. Let's uh, first start off uh, and introduce uh, our uh, esteemed panel on the far right. Uh, and we, of course, have Dr. Harry Edwards. He is sociologist, consultant to the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, and the way they're playing, he probably will be suiting up soon. They need as much help as they can. Uh, he is uh, he's a mentor to Colin Kaepernick during his time with the 49ers. He also has mentored a number of other players as well. And, of course, he's the author of The Revolt of the Black Athlete and the architect of the Olympic Project for Human Rights, which led to the Black Power Salute protest by Tommy Smith and John Carlos in Mexico City, 1968 Summer Olympics. Uh, and shout out to uh, Dr. Harry Edwards. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you. Terry Smith is Deputy Managing Director and Special Counsel for the NFLPA. She's the first woman to be Special Counsel for the NFLPA, assisting the Executive Director and Managing Partner in the direction of more than 100 employees and advisors, the ED, on discrete legal matters in the NFL. And let's just say I'm shocked she's not in a courtroom right now suing the NFL when it comes to Ezekiel Elliott. So we're certainly glad to have Terry Smith here. <laughs> It's all good, Terry. I hate the Cowboys more than I hate the Klan, so I don't mind him not playing. I, I'm from Houston, y'all. It's, it's, I'm from Houston. Don't worry about it. It's, a, it's another thing. Jason knows exactly what I'm talking about. Eton Thomas, how we doing, folks? Poet, author, retired NBA player, played nine years in the NBA with the Dallas Mavericks, Washington Wizards, Oklahoma City, and the Atlanta Hawks. He also has released three books, including a collection of poems called More Than an Athlete, and also Fatherhood, Rising to the Ultimate Challenge, I'm one of the contributors to Eton's book, so give it up for Eton Thomas. <laughs> Jason Reed is senior NFL writer for ESPN's The Undefeated. Uh, he's written a variety of, com uh, of columns examining the, the national conversation around uh, Colin Kaepernick, also Michael Bennett, uh, and as well as Dr. Edwards, about the NFL's racial divide. And so he spent years at the Washington Post. Uh, again, give it up for Jason Reed. There's always uh, news to start off with, and so we'll go ahead and start it that way. Four NFL players uh, wrote a letter to the league asking them uh, for a month dedicated uh, to social activism. The trolls are already busy at work uh, running their miles saying how dare uh, they actually do that. just want to get uh, anyone can jump out, no one in particular. Uh, we're going to have a back and forth conversation just on that particular letter challenging the NFL to acknowledge what athletes are doing with social activism and asking the league to get behind this effort? Anybody? Um, well, first of all, um, I think that Malcolm Jenkins and uh, Tory Smith, um, Anquan uh, Bolden, and Michael Bennett um, have done a tremendous service in terms of sending that letter uh, to Commissioner Goodell. Uh, Commissioner Goodell um, is not a bad guy. I mean, he uh, is in a very, very difficult position. He's in the middle of a boxing ring where you got players and the Players Association in one corner, you got sponsors and fans in another corner, you got the game in another corner, and then you got owner, owners in another corner, uh, and they're not wearing boxing gloves, they have baseball bats. So every issue that comes up, he has to deal with it. Uh, early on, Commissioner Goodell called me and asked, uh, how should the league approach uh, this new wave of athlete activism, which he and I had already talk talked about over a year ago. And I told him straight up that you have to get behind a movement from protest uh, to progress, from protest to programs to progress. And if the athletes can come up with programs, you want to be behind that 100%. And I also suggested that they start a kind of a kitchen cabinet of advisories from athletes, activist athletes, saying this is what we would like the league to do. So that letter that went in went to him, but he's in the middle of that boxing ring. How much he can do and how soon becomes an issue. 
Y'all scared to follow that? Go ahead. I mean, it's wide open. Okay. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Okay, I, I agree with much of that. I believe the commissioner is essentially an agent of the owners, and I do believe he's in a position to grant certain requests of the players, um, especially if he takes the position at any point that he is there to discern or uphold the integrity of the league, and I believe that request for player activism is a part of that. Well, the NBA is a little bit different than the NFL. Um, I, I really believe that if, if Colin Kaepernick would have been an NBA player, I don't think this would be a big deal. I don't think he would be, you know, blacked out of being able to, to No, no, on TV one, ball. we call it white balled. White balled. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, you know, I, I don't think there would be the repercussions. I mean, we've, we've had, you know, just look at what has happened in the NBA, you know, for the fact that after Eric Garner was murdered, um, you had all the players, all the teams wearing I Can't Breathe jerseys immediately after. Um, during the Worlds. I don't think that would have happened in the NFL. You know what I mean? I think the reaction would have been a lot stronger. I mean, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just a different league in, in, the, in its entirety. So I can speak from the NBA standpoint. Um, you know, I love the activism that I'm seeing in guys. I mean, right here in, in, with, with the Wizards. I mean, you, you saw when they had the back-to-back -back murders of Alton Sterling and, you know, and, and Bradley Bill came out, you know, firing out and saying what, what was, you know, what he didn't like that was happening. And he got the criticism, a little pushback from the fans. But from the ownership and from the, the league as a whole, there wasn't quite the, the pushback that you get in the NFL. So it's completely different. And so I understand what NFL players have to, have to deal with and why the Colin Kaepernick situation was so, you know, the, one of the first things that people said was, you know, why are more players jumping out there and supporting Kaepernick? I mean, I said it myself. You know, but then I had to really remember, well, it's two different leagues. So, you know, the repercussions are a, a lot stronger for the NFL. That's not excusing it or saying that they shouldn't jump out because after a while, more people did start jumping out. But th this is what it is. This is what it boils down to. There's strength in numbers. So if everybody does it, they can't fire everybody. You know what I mean? So what you saw in the WNBA where every – because at first they tried to find the, the WNBA players for wearing the shirts and they were wearing the black, oh, black yeah. shirts. And right. But everybody did it. They can't fire everybody. So they had no choice but to say, okay, well, now we're going to rescind the fines. You guys could do what you were going to do. And they were going to do that anyway. So that's, I mean, I would really say, you know, whenever I speak to young players, y'all just got to do it together. It can't just be one person over here because they can get rid of one person. They can get rid of two people, but they can't get rid of everybody. Well, and not, and not, not just together. I, remember, I mean, Doug Baldwin and I got into a very heated exchange on, on Twitter and then, we talked to each other offline where he was like, well, you know, I, I think really uh, Kaepernick did it the wrong way. And I was like, Doug, what the hell are you talking about? And so literally, I mean, the exchanges were, were really in depth. Uh, and then, of course, this year he comes out and goes, oh, man, he's getting screwed. And I went, Doug, do you recall our conversation last year? <laughs> Because, because it, and cause remember, when the Seahawks opened the season, they all, you know, linked arm in arm. And I'm going, all right, but you do need to understand what that means. Uh, and I think and it was one of those things. I think his actions scare a lot of them. It's kind of like, well, how can we how can we, you know, tamp this down? And then, of course, we see what happens when Mike Bennett gets gets basically a gun put his put to his head. And I think a lot of the, all these NFL players also forget if you were you were a black athlete in, in, uh, in Miami and South Beach, we have many, many stories of them being arrested, put on curbs in handcuffs. It's so all of a sudden it's like, yeah, now you realize what's going on, Jason. Well, the, the thing that struck me about the, the letter and, you know, talking to guys for some time within the league about what they want to see happen, this was kind of the natural evolution for me. The, the fact that these four players who have been at the forefront uh, of the movement, but the fact that they pen this, this, this memo, this letter, that essentially calls out the league for not standing with them in right versus wrong. I mean, this is not... Eric Reed, who's a player with the San Francisco 49ers, I had a really good conversation with him about this recently, is that his point is, and Ka Kaepernick and Bennett and all these brothers who have risked their careers to do this, is that we're, we're asking for decency. We're asking for equality. And the issues that they are pushing to the forefront are not things that are only exclusive to black folk. This is stuff that all people have or should have a vested interest in. And, with the letter, one of the interesting things about it is 
the the player said that they want to have the NFL do the same thing that it does for, for a situation like uh, breast cancer awareness or the military, causes that they deem important. And with what's going on in this country right now, I think anyone can make a credible argument that where we are in race relations is extremely, or should be extremely important to all of us. And they also put the league on blast from the standpoint of, we want you to partner with us. We want you to put, to put these immense financial resources that you have to work in supporting us. And the NFL workforce, the on-field workforce, is 70% African American. So it would seem to be in the league's best interest to, to at least take a position of, all right, what can we do? And Dr. Edwards is right. Roger Goodell, and wherever you come down on how everything else happens in the NFL, the bottom line is I think we can all agree Roger Goodell is in a difficult position. But when you have a position of great leadership, being in a difficult position sometimes is something you have to deal with. Well, when you made $200 million mm -hmm. in the last several years, uh, you were getting paid to make difficult choices. Um, but here's yeah. what I'll you know, let, me, let me say a, a, another thing about that. Um, the, 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 we, we have to deal with strategically the realities of the circumstances we're confronted with. How much money they're paying Goodell. Uh, if, if the owners can't get this resolved, that's not on him, that's on them. They pay too much. Uh, the, the, the reality is that th these are, 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 this situation is, is, is complicated. And, and, and just to give you some idea how complicated it is, um, the, the, a lot of the owners are quite happy with Colin Kaepernick being on the outside looking in because it changes the conversation. We're no longer talking about the issues that the brothers who wrote the letter, who wrote the memo were about. We're talking about whether or not Kaepernick has a job. That's the equivalent of getting into a debate about do you side with Ray Lewis and Michael Vick or do you side with Kaepernick in terms of this issue. I don't care what Ray Lewis and Michael Vick say. Uh, I know what the issues are and that was the point of Kaepernick's demonstrations. The same thing if he's on the outside looking in and now you have all kinds of people mobilized around getting in touch with the commissioner about whether or not Kaepernick has a job. Not only does the commissioner not hire anybody, uh, that should not really be the focus of a mass effort because it undermines the very thing Kaepernick was trying to get at. It's the equivalent of people going and mobilizing in Montgomery in 1956 in order to get Rosa Parks her seat back. You know, that, that's not what, that's how slick it is. So as long as Kaepernick is out there, the owners that don't want to deal with the real situation, which is the problem, white supremacy and patriarchy and all the rest, they don't want to deal with that. The murders that are going on 147 a year since 1968 in the black community by police officers. They don't have to deal with that. They can sit down and leave him out there, say absolutely nothing except chime in every now and then and say, as Lurie did last week, he can't play for my team. And everybody all of a sudden blows up. We got to get Kaepernick back in his bus seat. Well, you know what? That's not the issue. Well, so, but, well, so but, we but remember, but remember when he protested, the immediate deflection was about the anthem and not what he was protesting about. That was he, another he, red hair. Now, now he, now he, but, he, but here's why. Here's why. I began this by bringing Goodell's money up. Because when you talk about being strategic, it is no different than when the same corporations that support the NFL, when they took action against the state of North Carolina regarding a transgender bathroom bill. The very same companies have social responsibility policies. The very same company have affinity groups. The very same companies were threatened with their economic well-being by saying, oh, well, if you take this action uh, when it comes to those who are uh, gay and lesbian, when you take this action when it comes to women, uh, we are going to respond. And so people then said to CEOs, do you really want to go down this path? I think a part of this deal, when you begin to talk about, uh, and, and Mike Bennett and I had a conversation, he's a Texas A&M graduate, so am I, uh, a couple of weeks ago is, and that's the piece, people are responding, but you use that against the same owners and say, wait a minute, uh, the owner of the Ravens, you want to go talk to your sponsors, but your sponsors have social responsibility policies. And so how can you say this is bad when their own employees are saying we should be speaking out on these issues? And, I, I, and that's how also I think targeting them and because, look, and I said it in an earlier panel, there's only one federal agency that shares a lawn with the White House. Just one. 
Treasury. Do you understand America? White House power, Treasury Department is money. Power, money, money, power. America only responds to those two things. And so that's how to also get their attention. It's money. And so when you talk about strategic, Eton, from your, from your perspective, what would you say to players beyond just operating as a collective, what should be the next step for them? Well, I, I, look, I look at what the NBA did. Okay, I look, I look at the Donald Sterling situation. And when you're talking about um, economics, and the only reason why, I mean, I don't want to say the only reason why, but what pushed the NBA along at a faster pace, I'll say it like that, was the fact that they put economic pressure on them. That's it. Right, right here, we've been talking about with, with the Washington football team of, of changing the name for decades. Ain't nothing going to change unless we put economic pressure, unless they start getting hit in the pocketbook, unless sponsors start pulling out, unless people start saying, okay, if this still goes on, we will not put our dollars here. On the words of what Dr. King said April 3rd, 1968, we should redistribute the pain. No question. And the pain that they feel is economics. So, so in, in, in dealing with... In dealing with this situation, that's the only, that's what moves the needle. I mean, we could have different forums, we could talk to them, they could put in different, if, 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 if we want to really affect change, whether it's talking about the NFL, the NBA, that's like what you said, is what moves the needle is economically. Now, we've been talking about, you know, different people talking about boycotting, all right? They have to be able to actually feel that financially in order for it to be effective, yeah. or they will not care. Anybody could talk about, they could, we, could, we could shout to the heavens about how wrong it is. They know. When people are, have done wrong, they know they're wrong. It's not like we have to have anybody tell them that they're wrong. They know they're wrong. It's just a matter of what can they actually get away with. That's what I think. But, Terry, the issue that you have is the way the uh, deals are structured. The NFL owners, they get their television revenue checks at the beginning of the season. doesn't matter. Their deal is we don't care. When you see ratings are down, we're still getting our check. We're good. And so... If, if that's the case, um, and you're looking for people power, players is one thing, what do you want the people to be doing? Well, I want the people to support the players. Agreed that the TV money is a big portion of the NFL owner's checks, but concessions, those are things that the fans control. Letter writing, um, the pundits, the people that talk about the game, I agree with Dr. Edwards. There are a lot of red herrings that are causing distraction and not allowing the fans and the people to really see some of the real issues. So I encourage them to listen to the players. Listen to them as people. Listen to them as men. Don't think of them as just entertainment or somebody to just, you know, just kind of dance on the field. <clears throat> the players have done a tremendous job expressing themselves, and they've been fairly clear on what they've asked for. So. If I could make any plea to the people, it would be to listen to the players and respect their rights as Americans. You know, but Jace, it's very interesting when I hear the folks who, uh, I was tweeting with someone earlier, I wish they would just shut up and play football. Um, and, and the reason, reason I, I still find that to be humorous is because when I look at all of these different people who said all of these things when, when, when Muhammad Ali died, and oh my God, I mean, it was like we had the Pope, Mother Teresa, Dr. King, and Muhammad Ali. And folks are just going on and on and on, but without his, without his action, you don't have that same individual. Without him, him being outspoken, uh, and so it's just, it's just so interesting how uh, folks view that. Uh, and then no one obviously wants to read Jackie Robinson's word he wrote in his autobiography in 1972 when he laid out why he doesn't salute the flag or uh, stand for the national anthem. It's as if uh, that never existed. So may maybe only a few of us actually read his book. But, you, but, but even a lot of sports commentators don't want to say a word about that. No, well, they, it's the whole stay in your lane thing. They just want to see entertainment. They just want to see the athletes play. Now, interestingly, with all the devastation that we've had from the, from the hurricanes, J.J. Uh, Watt raised a ton of money. 20 for, plus million dollars. For hurricane relief. And not one person on Twitter said he needs to stay in his lane. He doesn't need to talk about you know, the problems and, and you know, raise this money because that was something acceptable to people. That was something that they could get behind. But a lot of these same people, black and brown people are dying every day, uh, having these horrible interactions 
uh, disproportionately horrible interactions with law enforcement, but they don't want to hear about that. They don't want to talk about the fact that these young brothers who are, who are risking their careers to make their voices heard, that they're human beings, and they have children, and they have lives, and they, and they want to see their children be able to grow up. You know, I mean, I, I have a 10-year-old son, and you know, when I talk to NFL players who are friends of mine, you know, we talk about, like, when have you had that conversation with your son about how to stay alive at a traffic stop? Does that mean that all police are inherently bad? Of course it doesn't mean that. But when people talk about staying in your lane, they don't see these young brothers as people. They see them merely as there for their entertainment. And when you have a, a, when you have a, a, a young black son and you have to talk to him about what you have to do to stay alive, that's why these issues are important to us, and that's why these brothers can't stay in their lanes or they choose not to. Harry, it's interesting when um, I look at, I mean, obviously stories that we focus on are totally different if you're watching CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and the rest of them. Uh, one story that did not get a lot of traction uh, were several of the Los Angeles Chargers uh, who talked about when they left San Diego, moved to LA, the racism that they encountered in housing in Los Angeles. One of them went public Again, that was one of those stories that whether you're talking about Kaepernick and police brutality or racism in housing, uh, folks are like, ah, yeah, but, but you're just, you're well paid, you can go live somewhere else. And they go, no, no, we, we want to live here. And again, this is, this is a reality that these players uh, are facing. Do you believe more players are going to open themselves up to some of those type of things that they've been experiencing to say this thing goes beyond police brutality. This, this speaks to even when you got money, you still black in America. Uh, yeah, let, let, me, let, me, let me go back real quick and, and, and say something about this uh, Don Sterling thing since it came up. One of my guys out of Berkeley, Kevin Johnson, was the liaison between the players and the NBA League office at that time. And he called me up and uh, we talked about a strategy that would um, enable the league to deal um, uh, proactively and, 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 and promptly uh, with Mr. Sterling. And um, the thing that uh, became very, very clear was that the one thing that would move the league is that if the players simply uh, hinted, they didn't have to commit, they simply hinted, we're not going to play against the Clippers. We're simply not going to come to L.A. and play against the Clippers. Um, and as soon as that began to sweep the league and you began to get people like the Warriors, you began to get people like LeBron James speaking out on it, they knew we have a major problem here. Because if they boycott this and don't show up, then we don't have a game and we are in trouble. And so they moved within two months, Sterling was gone. Um, now, if you're asking me whether or not that kind of dynamic as possible in NFL. Uh, the basic answer is, uh, first of all, you're dealing with uh, over 1,700 athletes. I mean, you're dealing with much larger number of people uh, who are involved. They are the football in, team is essentially five NBA teams. Yeah, yeah. You're, 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 looking at, you're looking at places all over the country, different political climates and so forth. So you're always going to have a substantial uh, number of people who look at it and say, I understand that, and I even support it, but I can't bring myself to join it. You're going to, you're going to have that. But the wonderful part about it is, in any kind of movement, it's never been a majority right. who have been in the forefront. I mean, it's always been an active, aware, and courageous minority who have stepped up and said, let's take care of this. It was very lonely for yeah. Kurt Flood. And, and, and they, realize, they realize that it not only impacts uh, their communities, it impacts them. The only reason it was Mike Brown in that street, rather than LeBron James or Colin Kaepernick, is that they weren't there. Uh, and at the end of the day, that becomes the fundamental reality uh, that these athletes are dealing with. Not every athlete took a knee at the San Francisco 49ers. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the season, they voted Colin Kaepernick uh, the Eshmont Award, which is the highest award that the organization gives for inspiration, courage, and leadership. They voted it to Colin Kaepernick, the players, almost unanimously. So we have to look at this thing and keep it in perspective. Uh, when we uh, talk about uh, as, as this season uh, is, is going along uh, and uh, there, are no, there are people who say they're not going to watch, the people who are not watching. Um, do you believe also, Jason, I want you to answer this first, that what is happening is not centrally organized? 
in that, because what I've heard from even a lot of activists, they've been saying, I've heard this, 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 but in terms of you not having not just one or even two, but, but something that is clear, concise, and directed. Uh, Mike, Mike Blake's here yesterday with the Women's March. They had the Women's March, six million unified across the country, but they also had 10 steps to do over the next 100 days. How critically important is this when you talk about a movement to have somebody or an entity leading it, organizing it, and sort of uh, as, the, as, as a central focus for people to be able to reach out to for information? Well, it's interesting. When they, they had the uh, rally for Kaepernick in New York, I talked to uh, probably 10 people who are on the front lines of this movement, activists. And yeah, Roland, I, I, would, not, I would say that it's not totally centrally organized. There isn't a, a necessarily a unified message that everyone is getting out constantly that, that is coming down. But I definitely also think that there are several people who are at the forefront of this thing who are talking. I mean, you know, Ka Kaepernick has consulted with a lot of people in, in, in trying to educate himself. I know Dr. Edwards can speak to this as well. Um, well, that's how he and I were going to talk right. two years ago. Right, because he, he, what he's done is he's, you know, he, 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 he talked to Dr. Edwards a lot, but he also reached out to other people across the country to try to educate himself. And that's one of the things that, that the players, have, the players who are at the forefront of this thing is what they, Malcolm Jenkins, you know, when I've talked to him and other people about, they wanted to educate themselves as to what the issues are. Because people, the people who push back on social media and tell them to stay in their lanes, they seem to think that this is just an anthem protest, that that's all they're doing, and it's not. And one of the things, and having been on panels with, with a lot of these brothers, one of the things that so infuriates them is that, yeah, we're not all sitting down and planning out a strategy, but there are pockets all over the country where this is going on. But the main thing, and the most important thing, and I'll, and I'll let Dr. Edwards, you know, because I always refer to him because he knows a lot more about stuff than I do. But the main thing is, is that they got themselves educated about what they needed to do. So it's not just that they are people who are you know, raising fists because they're saying, okay, you know, screw American, screw the anthem. No, they're out there and they are organized. Is it completely organized across the board in terms of one centralized message? message? No. But, I, but, but I'm not talking about the players. I'm not talking about the players. I'm talking about the public. In terms of because the, because the players have one job, one responsibility, one arm of this, public has another. And what I'm saying is, uh, even with that particular rally, and again, I was I, I had them on the show. We talked about it, and like any protest, you can ask, you can take your pick, whether it's Reverend Jackson, Sharpton, Moriel, you can go down the line. I always ask them the same question: the event is Saturday or Monday or Tuesday. What is the plan for Sunday, Wednesday, and Thursday? And that, I think, from the, pub, from the public standpoint, is one of the reasons why people are right now, I think, walking around going, I want to do something, I want to say something, but, okay, I don't know really who to call, what to look up, where to start. And it's sort of, it's, it's there, but it's, again, it's not necessarily organized. That's what I'm speaking Okay, of. You, yeah. So, you know, in making Colin Kaepernick a martyr, which I warned the league about, doing. They shouldn't do that. They have given a focus to a movement that emerged that otherwise doesn't have a central focus or central leadership. The problem with that is the same problem that uh, Occupy movement ran into. They had a lot of people with Precisely. a lot of grievances and over a period of time it simply dissipated for lack of an organized central eye like a hurricane. It just blew itself out. Uh, the same with the women's movement, that, that they had the movement, they had the march, but there was no organized central thrust that would carry forward into the days that followed. Here we have a focus on Kaepernick, which the owners uh, who uh, don't want to deal with any of this would love to see out there because it changes the conversation. And if they wanted to bring it into it, they would just give him a clipboard, put him on a team, make him the third quarterback, and the whole movement began. Then where do they go? What do they have? The, the, the way it's organized from the public perspective at this point, there's not even a clear demand on the NFL other than Kaepernick right. getting a job. 
And that's not going to get it done. We have to be more strategic. We have to be smarter than that. And ultimately, somebody's going to have to step forward and say, OK, here's what we're demanding. And here's how it redounds to the community of interest that Kaepernick was trying to bring uh, uh, focus and highlight to to begin with. And I will, just like I do on my show, I do have to offer a fact check. It is not true that the Women's March is not organized. They are very organized. Uh, I didn't say that they weren't organized. No, you said central. I, no, I said that there was, in terms of the central focus of everybody who was there, there were conversations afterwards. I know because, you know, I paid some women's way back there. Uh, the, 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 there were conversations afterwards about, okay, where do we go from here? What about women of color? What about poor women? What about women who live in the urban areas and the rural areas? Where is all of that in there? And they were not together on that. And that's all I'm saying about this movement. There's a lot of concern about right. police killings and so forth, but not everybody's on the same page with regard to it. Well, and what I was, and yeah, what I would say to those women, three of the four organizers of that Women's March were, uh, uh, were, were two African American, one Muslim, one Latino, one white, yeah. and they had they had that. And what and what they've done is because also the folks, Detroit, October 29th through the 31st, the Women's March will have their national conference in Detroit over those three days. I'll see y'all there because I'll be one of the speakers. Uh, and so Tamika, uh, uh, no, I'm just, <laughs> and, and, t I'm just saying, t t Tamika Mallory, Carmen Perez, Linda Sarsour, uh Trust me, they're doing that. And so that's taking place Detroit, October 29th through the 31st. But on the piece of of, uh, on the organizing piece, uh, Terry, and I'm going to come back to the people, but how, how, how is the NFLPA working with players on that aspect, which is, which is different from contracts, which is different from grievances, but assisting them, whether it's getting, or getting additional information and also helping them uh, to organize themselves from this perspective? Okay, great question. Um, first, I just wanted to make it clear, we are a labor union, um, and there's, <laughs> yay, yay, labor, yeah. labor, we like it, organized labor, um, and there are certain things that fall easily within our scope, and then there are some that fall outside, and then there are some blurred lines. Um, at the moment, we are supporting our players. What does that mean? We, at a minimum, assist them in facilitating um, some of the platforms for really whatever they want to say, and I'm not just social injustice, but for charities, for foundations, for community involvement, anything. Um, Malcolm Jenkins and Anquan Bolden, we've accompanied them to the Hill. We've made sure that they had the meetings, and if, if there were any places where there were knowledge gaps for any players, we filled in those gaps. So that, that's something we could do at a minimum. At a maximum, we work together with our board of player reps, and we have a committee that those players, some of the ones I mentioned, Malcolm Jenkins in particular, who is a player rep, they lead that committee and they decide their efforts. Now what we do to follow is up to them, but we give them as much support as needed and as much support as we can. As a, as a, as a, as a union, have you reached out to other unions who have been involved in this work for quite some time uh, in terms of uh, seeking their guidance and support as well? Uh, in aligning, uh, in aligning, aligning themselves with with the NFLPA as well on this. That's something that we always do, pretty much on every subject. We're always there to give guidance. Um, as was alluded to earlier, we obviously can't, you know, go forth with some sort of referendum because, you know, our players. It's a collective aspect, so we need them to make sure that they have the same shared perspective and they're bringing it to us in an organized way before we can do anything on behalf of all of them. But we always consult the other unions, and in fact, our executive director sits on the executive board of the AFL-CIO, so that's, that happens no matter what's going on. Yeah, but, 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 but has AFL-CIO, has SEIU, has AFSCME, have, have those others, uh, have they publicly uh, taking a stance publicly aligning themselves with the NFLPA and the players on, on these particular issues and offering their assistance and offering their membership to help mobilize and organize around this. Yeah. That has not happened to my knowledge and that also has not been requested to my knowledge. That's not been requested. Even by the players who are participating in social activism. But, here, but again, to Jason's point, uh, and again, first of all, I'm not going to assume they don't know. 
uh, but I do, but I, I do think a lot of times uh, again we, we often talk about uh, the big six civil rights organizations, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Uh, the reason the jobs part was even put in that plank was because of the lab labor union support for that particular effort. So I think a lot of times people don't realize m a significant number of uh, the movements we've had in the black community. Labor was right there, and so so I so I so I would I would so. So I would suggest uh, that, the, that the NFLPA uh, make that point and seek that because, to Dr. Dr. Edwards' point, when you talk about central, central organization, movement, and bodies, all of a sudden, because trust me, this was also part of the Women's March, if you have those large unions uh, in, which have significant black membership, if all of a sudden they are enlisted, now all of a sudden you now are talking about one, two, three, four, five, seven hundred thousand people who can descend upon NFL parks across the country, NFL stadiums across the country, who can also do things. And now you have infrastructure and organization which is needed. I, I totally agree with that. The only place I can push back there is to say that remember, we are a union that's made up of our members and we are guided by them. But so, so are they. Understood, but I, I can't speak for them. I can only speak for us. And if we've asked the players, particularly ones who are leading the movements in their own designated way, whether they want us to take certain action, we cannot do it unless they allow us to. But I'm saying, have you asked them that? Yes. About, other, about uh, uh, seeking well, other we've unions? We've asked them for a number of different efforts, um, both in the court, off the court, labor unions, uh, everywhere, can, can, even in can, conversation go ahead, Jason. with the NFL. Just, but we can't really take that action unless they allow us to do so. And, and I will say, Roland, from talking to, there are a, a lot of brothers out there who are unified and believe that so many things that are wrong need to be addressed and they're standing up and they're going into communities and they're putting their time and they're getting educated. Uh, you know, just to talk about Colin with the Know Your Rights camps, you know, Eric Reed, his teammate was, was, was you know, w with him on that. And talking to a lot of these, because I, co I cover the whole NFL, and I travel constantly, and I'm in locker rooms all over the country, there also are brothers out there who are like, look, this NFL stands for not for long. And the, contact, the contracts are not fully guaranteed. The average, life, the, the average career is, depending on who you believe, like three or 3.5 years. The, the league would push back on that and say it's longer. So I, I know that people feel that the union simply, there are a lot of people feel that the union simply has not done enough, but there are, you know, there are things that the union can only do if its, if its members are united in doing it. And from talking, and this is just anecdotally, I haven't done a, mm -hmm. you know, a poll or anything, but just speaking anecdotally with a lot of these brothers out there, a lot of them feel like, look, what happened to Kaepernick is wrong, and there are these issues, and there are these problems, but they're trying to get another contract. And wherever you come down on that, I mean, for me, like the reason I like talking to Michael Bennett and Eric Reed, um, you know, and, and uh, everybody who's been at the forefront of this thing is because you see what they are trying to ach achieve. You see the change that they're trying to affect. But that takes courage. I mean, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of courage to put your career in the line. I was on a panel with Malcolm Jenkins. Uh, yeah, you can ask a lot of people in Birmingham and right. Selma and Ab Albany, Albany, Georgia that. A absolutely, absolutely. I, I, was on a, I was on a panel with it's, Malcolm. There's a, it's a whole bunch of black students who, were, who, who joined SNCC, who, who HBCU president said, we will kick you out of this campus if you join SNCC. And they were close to graduation, yeah. and they still joined. So I understand those right. brothers' point, but, I, yeah. no, no, I'm just, but, but Jason, go ahead. No, look, and I'm not, I'm not taking a position that I agree with that, okay? I'm just saying this is the way it is. But I was on a panel with Malcolm Jenkins in New York, and you know, we talk about who the leaders are in this movement. To me, what Malcolm Jenkins has done, he's been up on the hill talking about criminal justice reform. He's in the community. I mean, he's not the only one, but right. he has put himself in a position to where, yeah, he's a great player, and so he has a lot of equity built up, where maybe some other players don't have as much equity built up on their teams. But I look at him when we talk about people who are leaders, and we had a long conversation back in the green room before we went on the panel, and I, you know, I put it to him, like, how do you feel about these brothers in the league who, and there are some star brothers in the league, who will make comments like, don't bother me with that. And I asked him, you know, look, off the record, my, my tape recorder, my notepad's off, how do you feel about it? And his thing is, He's focused 
on the people like him who want to affect change. And it, it was a very telling answer to me because he didn't tear anybody else down. And look, look, there are a lot of cats out there who are stars who don't want to be involved with this. They want to get their checks. They want to get their endorsements. And you, you know, Br Brandon Marshall was a linebacker from the uh, Denver Broncos who's one of Cap's line brothers uh, in the greatest fraternity known, known to man, Cap Alpha Psi Incorporated. Uh, um, uh, um, now y'all uh, know damn well okay. that's a lie. Um, you ain't never heard somebody uh, say capital uh, greatest. Bre Brandon Remember, Alpha's your daddy. Okay. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Bre Bre Brandon Mar Brandon All right, Jason. Bre Brandon, Brandon Marshall told me, <laughs> I know you ain't going to have me back on the show anymore. No, yeah, right? I have, okay. you, I have uh, you back on an Alpha show. Okay, all right. Um, but, you know, the, the, thing that, the thing that Brandon Marshall told me is that, like, for him, he lost some endorsements when he decided to protest. Yep. And there are other brothers who have faced backlash. The social media backlash, as Roland's talked about, is horrible. But the thing he said to me is, and he talks to Cap, and you know, they talk about these things, and he would not feel right if he did not make a stand. And he said, just keeping it real, for him, this was worth the price he had to pay. For everybody, it's not. It's interesting when you said, I mean, Dick Gregory, had his, we had his funeral on Saturday, and uh, we, we live streamed the whole funeral. You can catch it on YouTube. And they, they, played, a, they played a video at the beginning of his funeral. Uh, and, and, and it was, it was this amazing comment because it, he said, uh, at the height of his career, he was making more money than Frank Sinatra. And he literally walked away from that at the height of his career. And what was very interesting, what Dick said is he said, there was nothing in my life that gave me the feeling or the satisfaction, uh, that fighting for freedom of black folks did, which is why I walked away. And there was another story uh, where he was having issues make, make, paying his mortgage and Bertram Lee, uh, black businessman here, wrote him a $100,000 check and without blinking, he immediately signed it over to Hosea Williams and the Black Freedom Movement. Um, and it was interesting, you know, he, he made that point and you're right, uh, I think some people do forget that they are athletes. I mean, one of the first conversations Colin Kaepernick and I had was he said, you know, I want to get more information, I want to learn more. I said, totally understand, but first, learn the playbook first, and then us the stuff secondary. So we, 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 we were just joking back and forth and laughing, uh, but that still is their primary job. Dr. Edwards, what role do retired players play? What role do you should play in this? Well, I think a, a, a lot of this, I go back to my original point. What are we demanding of the NFL? whether we're talking about unions organized together with the Players Association, whether we're talking about masses of people uh, from fraternities and sororities and churches and so forth, civil rights organizations in the street who are picketing stadiums and so forth, what are we demanding from the NFL other than Colin Kaepernick being on a roster? Which what should? Is really, which is really a diversion. What should we? Well, I think that you should be going back to the issues that Colin Kaepernick uh, was protesting about, which means that even though uh, sports fandom may be a center uh, that allows people to come together uh, and say all of the members, all of the fandom of the San Francisco 49ers are going to petition uh, uh, Congress to do something about uh, a bail uh, bond reform or to do something about some of these incarceration mm -hmm. rates or to do something about uh, police uh, function reform. You have to have something other than uh, simply going to the stadium and protesting. So uh, when, you, when you ask about, um, uh, when you raise the issue of leadership in this, you have to have a strategy, you have to have goals. If the NFL is going to be the focus of this thing, which it is now, people are boycotting games, blackouts, tune out, turn off the NFL and so forth. What are we demanding of the NFL? And a lot of the problem with, uh, that, that retired players, that even active players have, is that they do not know what are we demanding of the NFL? What are you asking me? to step aside on my job for, and I, and I do not even know what we're demanding of the NFL since that's the focus. I keep going back to that. It, and again, it, you, you can talk about leadership in this movement and everything else, but it goes back to the same old, old song. If, 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 if you're leading something that has no focus, no strategy, no goal, right. no particular demands, you're not leading anything. You're just out for a walk. Eat time. So, 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 at, so, at, so at the end of the day, I go back to what are we demanding of the NFL? And maybe 
If we can figure that out, we'll be able to figure out what it is we're demanding of American society and its institutions. Eitan, what should be on that list of demands? Well, what I saw from, from the list that the NFL players put together of saying that they wanted a month dedicated great to start. activism, I thought that was great. And the, the fact of the power that the NFL has to get things done, I mean, just some of the things, and, and Dr. Edwards, because of course, talked to it, that the 49ers started to institute after Colin Kaepernick's stance was that they went to different police stations, and they were talking to the police as groups, and they went to different um, community organizations, and they were having different things. They were trying to bridge the gap. and say, like, okay, this is what the police were saying that they wanted. This is what, that's something that as an NFL organization that you have the power to do. For, so for them to say, look, we want you just as much as you put all the emphasis on different things, like you said, breast cancer awareness or the things like that, we want you to put that emphasis on activism. I think that's great. I think there's a there's a certain there's there's a certain people think that everybody has to be on the same page or everybody has to be unified, which has never been the case. Never ever been the case. There's so, a whole so, bunch of black folks who said they marched when they were at of home. Of course. <laughs> so we, we talk we talk about the civil rights and we talk about the '60s as if all the athletes were like Dr. Harry Edwards, and they weren't. There were a lot of athletes that were like OJ. First of all, a lot of people. I mean, that's the honest truth. Just like there was a lot of athletes Most now that are like, oh, well, they well, don't want anything to do with Well, them. also, a lot, of people, a lot of people also forget the fact that uh, Dr. King and others, they were kicked out of the, Southern, uh, of, the, of the National Baptist Convention USA. In fact, there was such a battle over civil rights that there was a floor fight and there was a pastor who fell off the podium who was killed uh, because it, it, it hit his head. Uh, and that's why they left to form the Progressive National Baptist Convention. Right. Preachers were fighting. And then the, the, the very preacher, his name was Reverend Jackson, not the one we know. Uh, it was another preacher, and he hated King so much mm -hmm. that when King was assassinated, uh, when they renamed the street in Chicago, MOK Drive, he changed his official address to the side street so his church would not be on MOK Drive. I mean, it's just like, it's just like what you said when Muhammad Ali passed, that everybody talked about him glowing, in glowing colors, and that we love Muhammad Ali, and we give statues to him, and, you know, buildings and all this stuff. But when I call alive, that the America's bobblehead syndrome. Oh, oh, no question. When he was alive, they hated Muhammad Ali. Mainstream America is what I'm talking about. And no, no, no. They, they hated him when he could talk. They hated him when he could talk and what he stood for. So the, what you're seeing right now with Kaepernick and the, and the mainstream America's reaction from Kaepernick, think of that times 10, times 100 with Muhammad Ali in his heyday. So it's not, so right now people can say, and then as far as a lot of people in our community can say, oh, we was right with Muhammad Ali. Like, no, you weren't. Well, actually. You know what I mean? Or we was right with Dr. King. We was all supporting Malcolm X. Well, no, actually, at this, at this time in 1967, Dr. King had his lowest approval ratings in his entire life. Right. Last year of his life, he was hated. Jason, what should be on this list of demands? Well, I think a financial partnership, financial backing, I mean, if you're talking about a wish list, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, money money to, uh, you know, Dr. Edwards was talking about, well, what, what's the ask? Well, if, if we're talking about criminal justice reform, you know, money to get there and, and, and money for, to help uh, hire lobbyists to affect the change that, that they, that they want to affect. If we're talking about the league in terms of what it can do to support social activism, the month of November would be nice, but what about just a commitment from of ownership of the 32 teams to be engaged in a thoughtful process with hiring someone to for each team to help organize, to help refine what the issues are? I mean, if, if the league really wants to take an opportunity to partner with these players, like there are a lot of players who still don't know. Like I talk to guys who tell me that even with all of this out there and all the activism that's going on, that they still are like, okay, well, I, I'm not sure what I can do. If the league, and I'm not saying this is gonna happen, but the league hires all types of positions. Okay, hire someone to help players who wanna get educated about what the issues are to help them get educated. So it's not just these players, you know, educating themselves. I mean, that's fine. So you're and, saying have each team create a position? Yes. Uh, basically have uh, 32 Dr. Harry Edwards. Basically, yeah. And, and There's only one, but you right. know what I'm talking well, about. Well, but, but but here's the thing, you know, what 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 the San Francisco 49ers did was pioneering. They they took this man who was an expert who had you know or, organized the Black Power Salute, who had been at the forefront of the the previous six civil rights movement, and they said, okay, tell us what we need to do. And the fact that every NFL team does not have someone like Dr. Harry Rose, especially in t in, t in today's climate, says a lot about what owners think about where we are. 
They don't, it's not something that they, that they deem necessary. So yeah, I think that that would be a big move to have, you know, and Dr. Edwards, you tell me if I'm wrong about this, but if there was a Harry Edwards on every team, wouldn't the issues be more, more refined than they are right now? I think you'd raise the IQ of the team substantially, but okay. uh, I, mean, that's enough. <laughs> I don't know how much after. Hey, let, look, what, what we did, uh, when, 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 when Kaepernick began to sit down for the national anthem, the ownership of the San Francisco 49ers, the managing owner, Jed Yard, came to me and said, Doc, this is your horse. you you got to manage this. And I told him at the time, not only are we going to get through this, we're going to come out of it better. Everybody's going to come out of it better. And what we did was, uh, first of all, um, I talked to Cap. We uh, decided, hey, you don't have to stop what you're doing. But what we have to do is to explain and articulate Mm -hmm. what you're doing out of respect, not just to your teammates, but to everybody else in the league and to the fans and sponsors and everybody else, which we did, which he did. Uh, the other thing that happened was Jed came back and said, okay, now what can I do? I said, well, Cap has put a million dollars on the table. He said, I'm going to put a million dollars on the table too, and we're going to put it in programs. You have to come up with the program. So we came up with what we call barbershop conversations, where we go to the community, bring in the gangbangers, the movers, the shakers, the organizers, everybody else, and we have bar free barber haircuts, salon conversations for the women and the women police officers because you can't go in and be railing and ranting and throwing your hands up if you're getting your hair cut unless you want to get up looking like a clown. So, so they, we had police officers sitting in chairs talking to players, uh, talking to people from the community about these issues, trying to bridge that gap of conversation and understanding. Uh, we also uh, have programs that, that we're dealing with uh, that are already ongoing. They just needed twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars. So we tried to uh, make that connection of moving from protests uh, to progress in terms of these issues. Every team should be doing that. In the age of the social media, what happens one place happens every place. It's just a matter of time. Before I ask Terry to step away from her NFL PA title and ask what does she think personally uh, should be on the list of demands. Uh, Dr. Edwards, for, for those folks who don't know, how were you even hired? What was that process? How, what, how did that even come about? Uh, Bill Walsh and I have been exchanging lectures and, and articles and memos and everything from 1982 right up until 1985 when he brought me on the team, uh, basically to organize programs. I had organized a bunch of programs for after school programs for the Black Panther Party. And when I had sent him those programs, he said, hey, you know what? These programs will work in the NFL. We need programs because the demographics are changing. We need to do better by the athletes. So I had organized programs of uh, college uh, degree completion, I organized programs programs, post-career occupational preparation, family uh, counseling, drugs, and so forth, and then finance, taxes, and investment. Uh, all of those were instituted in um, uh, the 49ers, and eventually the whole league picked them up. But originally, I had organized these programs to educate young athletes and coaches uh, in the African-American community while I was a member of the Black Panther Party. So Bill Walsh was a pioneer in stepping out. He didn't care about my history, my record, and so forth. He wanted programs, he wanted proactive action around these issues. And this was 1985, 86 season. So we were uh, quite a ways ahead of uh, everybody else, at least Bill Walsh was. Ask, what should I ask on that? What should be on that list, Terry? Speaking personally, not for the union, not as a lawyer, let's have all of the, the any other, um, um, uh, any of the statements uh, that we need to put up, just your thoughts. What should be on that list? That is a tempting offer to step away from all of that, but that is a little... I've tough. given enough disclaimers. <laughs> Did I not meet all the legal requirements with the disclaimers for you? And I appreciate the reminder, too, <laughs> that this is televised, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'm not going to step all the way away, but luckily, <laughs> what I Well, generally speaking, what would Terry <laughs> like for athletes uh, in all professional sports to be focused on when it comes to social issues? Well, the question is twofold. There are a couple of things I'd like the NFL to do, if I could answer that question first. That, it's, a, it's a little tough for me to say what players should do. Um, but for the NFL, I do think, you know, at a minimum, you know, I, I keep using this word, but there's a lot of different tentacles to it. I do think they should be supportive of their employees. Um, one of the things that I think is just important to note that 
yes, Colin Kaepernick is currently unemployed, but it doesn't have to be that way, and it's not just really one man on this issue. I do wish that there were a scenario, and the NFL is in control of this, where he could be allowed to work and not have to sacrifice his career um, for you know criminal justice reform and his livelihood and everything else that comes after that. You know the the livelihood in the NFL is so short anyway, but to see it cut short for this reason is really tragic. So that's one thing I think they could do. Um, I think their support needs to be public. So we have some players who have gone other routes with their platform. They've come to the Hill. As always, money talks. That's been stated a number of times. They could fund and support those efforts or support organizations that are already organized um, in those efforts. So I don't think there would be anything wrong with that. They could donate the platforms they already have before games, television time for PSAs, uh, create an outlet for the players to be able to state their opinions and again, not be sacrificed for it. Um, so a number of things I think that the league could do, but most importantly, I, I do wish that they would sit down and have a, a thoughtful conversation with the players who, who have issues, you know, that are really permeating our society and, and not just in the league. Um, Wait, go ahead. I, I don't have as much thought on what players should do, but I do say that I applaud the efforts that are being taken thus far, and I just hope to see them continue. Uh, Jason, I know um, ESPN around Martin Luther King's birthday uh, has an annual televised uh, discussion they do. Uh, it, would be, it would be interesting if, uh, if this year is Roger Goodell and all owners that with that one. Talk to, talk to Rob King about that. You need, you need me to text him? Well, you, you, you talk to him when you guys play golf. How's okay, that? all right. All right, we'll do that. Mr. All right, Mr. so. Mr. Martin, let, me, let me ask you. Let go me, ahead. Let me just say something real quick, because I think we, I don't, I don't know if we necessarily hit on this, but the reason why they specifically don't want Colin Kaepernick back in the league right now and what message they specifically want to send to all other players is, is specifically and strategically done. It's the same thing that happened back in the day when David Stern and the NBA sent that message to Mahmoud Abdul-Rauf. And to Craig Hodges. There's a specific reason that if you go down this path, if you step out and do this, you will get Kaepernick. That's what it is. So white bald. White bald. Okay, but but Kaepernick. I, I heard, you know what, you know, when I when I spoke out against the war in Iraq and I was playing with the Wizards, I actually had people warn me that say you were gonna get done like my Mudo Duaruf, you better be careful. You know what I mean? You're, you're going to get done like Craig Hodges. Remember what happened to him? And that's the message that they want to send to all other NFL players. So to, to think that the NFL is going to institute something where they want to actually, you know, educate all the players on social activism and be all supportive of it, I don't think that's really realistic. I mean, I think that the 49ers is a separate case. I mean, you know, I don't really see all of the different, and I don't have to call them out by, by name, but how many of them, 10 or 11 of them, supported Donald Trump? You know what I mean? They, 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 they um, committed finances to his to his foundation. That was that, 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 that was seven NFL teams okay, that contributed so a million dollars to the inauguration, and there's an NFL owner who is one of Trump's ambassadors. So do you expect, Woody Johnson of the Jets? So, so do you expect them to to really care about social activism of black players? I mean, we have to really be honest of it and, and know the reason why they're doing it. So what we need to do is be able to support athletes when they do come out and speak out. And we have, you know, we have a handful of reporters. We have you, we have Michael Smith and Jamel Hill, maybe a few other ones that black, I'm talking about black uh, reporters that will come out and tackle the different issues. When you have Bill O'Reilly talking about, um, you know, Kaepernick and talking bad about him. And you have, you know, Ooh, Sean Oh, his and, ass wouldn't you, call me. Listen, oh, listen, I was. Listen, listen, what I'm saying is. He on I'm the saying, prayer list, call me. You have a handful <laughs> of reporters who will support them, is what I'm saying. We don't have a lot of reporters that will support them, is what I'm saying. Okay, a lot of times they're out there on their own. And you have different people who are misconstruing their message. You know, Captain Mick came out and said, I am doing this because of this. I'm, I'm protesting police brutality. I don't like the election process. I don't like. He specifically said what it was about. And the first thing they said was like, oh, he's disrespecting the military. He said, this is not about the military. Stop, stop talking about Jason Whitlock. <laughs> I mean, I didn't want to name him by name, but okay. But 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 I'm saying though we need more voices, powerful voices, to come out in support of athletes when they do speak out, so they can so they can go against the Jason Whitlocks of the world, Correct. who are going to come out and they're going to talk about it because they know that once they do that, they're going to start moving up the ladder because that's exactly what Fox News and all the people want 
to hear a black face do. You know what I mean? Talk against a person like Kaepernick. Talk against a person like Michael Bennett. So we need, we need you to keep doing what you're doing and to get more of your colleagues to do the oh, same. Oh, you got to remember, I'm now two hours a day. I'm in that ass twice a I, day. I know you do, right? And it's so bad. We Whit Whitlock unfollowed me. He won't return text messages. I said we can debate anytime. Your show, my show, pick one. Because I ain't scared of none of them. That's good. Dr. Yeah. Edwards, go yeah, ahead. Let me, let me just, I, mean, I want to say, say something. Just, just show you where my head is on this. Um, so far, this thing has been consigned basically to the man cave. I mean, you're talking about whether, not, black, whether, whether uh, uh, it's uh, athletes uh, who are protesting, whether it's fans. And you hear, when you talk about fans, you're talking principally about men, uh, owners, men. Um, I think that uh, wherever there has been movement, we have galvanized uh, substantially around women, even if they were behind the scenes doing all of the work. I think that one thing, if I had a list that the NFL could do, it would be to take a very strong, absolutely unequivocal stand against violence against women, get them mobilized as, a, as an aspect of their social justice stand, perhaps even the initial aspect. You're talking about the women's conference that's coming up, the, the, the Million Woman March and so forth. We have a situation in this country right now. We talk about 147 blacks being shot down by police, where over 90% of the women who are murdered are murdered by people, intimate relations. And we're talking about somewhere um, in the uh, vicinity of uh, uh, 10 times. I mean, you have three women killed in this society every day by men in their lives. That's a lot of women. You're talking about over a 1,000 women who are murdered. And when you look at the 164 concussions reported last year in the NFL, tremendous problem, absolutely uh, unacceptable. But there were 20 million women and girls walking around in this society last year with concussive effects as a result of being beaten, stomped, slammed against the wall, slapped, punched, kicked, drug across the room, knocked unconscious, and so forth. And the league turns around and drafts a young man who was caught on tape knocking a woman unconscious. So what I'm saying is that if we want to get a full-scale movement going around social issues, Let's mobilize around women and then get their power behind what we're talking about in terms of some of this other stuff that's going on in the African American community. It has always been that way. But just, we don't want to look at that. This right now what we have is a movement going in the man cave. That's not going to get it done. Well, just keep in mind, after the Ray Rice case, uh, and then there were a group of black women who wanted to meet with the NFL. Uh, they chose not to meet with them. And it wasn't until a couple of male civil rights leaders got involved and they said, fine, we'll meet with you. So, and I talked to those sisters, Melanie Campbell and others. Now, here's the deal. They gave me a list. Yeah, they gave me some written questions. I ain't reading those. Um, so here's the deal. Here, here ground rules. Uh, gr no, I believe in live questions. I'm sorry, I don't do written. So here's the deal, I'll, 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 I'll sell down. So here's, here's what to happen. Okay, we got ground rules. First ground rule, I got the damn mic. I don't need your help holding it. Keep your hands in your pocket. Okay, second rule, sermonettes are for Sunday. It's Thursday. I need questions, I will cut you off. Third thing, we're not lining up. I'm going that side, middle, that side, back, middle, that side. If you old, don't try to say I'm a senior citizen, you ain't skipping the line. Okay, I don't wanna hear, if you're an alpha, well, you will get in front of a kappa. Uh, but we'll go ahead and start over here. So uh, stand up. I need your name, where you from, what's your question, uh, and then I'm going on. How you doing? Hansi from Boston. Um, questions for um, Dr. Edwards. Do you, know if there's, do you know if there's a concerted effort to mobilize athletes across different leagues to have a summit similar like they did for Muhammad Ali? Uh, yes, that, that's something that's been discussed uh, going back to the 1967 conference that uh, Jim Brown organized. Uh, that's something that's been discussed uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, what are the chances of it coming together? I really don't know because, again, we have the issue of leadership and a strategic ask 
that everybody can kind of come around on. Uh, Ali being kicked out of boxing, that was a strategic situation. His refusal to join the military, that was a strategic situation that everybody could say, let's go in and sit down and talk to him about this. Uh, there are a number of instances where people have tried to organize conferences, but we're missing some pieces. Question. Dr. Jewel Crawford, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, excuse me, cameraman, I'm trying to address the question. Dr. I'm trying to put you on TV. What's wrong? That's, that's my camera. I can, I can, well, I can hear this you way. Not then. I can hear you. Okay. We need police civilian review boards in our community to deal with these murderous police that are killing our children. And we need some civilian review boards that have some teeth. Now, the athletes that are standing up and holding their fists up and all that, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. But they could do a lot to support our communities and having these civilian review boards to have some teeth to get rid of these. These people are killing our kids and going right back to work to kill some more. And so we need the NFL, everybody that's holding their fists out and growing their afro out and all that, we need them to back us up when we have our, these review boards that we're trying to form in our communities to uh, get rid of these police and get them dealt with, you know, when they are murdering our children. But, okay. let, me, but, but, yeah. but let, me, let, me, let me say this first. Yeah, because that was a statement. That was not a question. Uh, no, no, I, I got you. But, 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 but here's also what is happening. What is happening is even if you have a police civilian review board, they're not the ones who determine who charges a police officer. So what we've seen as a result of the protests, we've seen actually progressive, district attorneys that have been elected. Aaron Masayal, the first black D uh, state's attorney in Florida. We saw Tim uh, McGinty, who was the DA in Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, who got booted out of the Tamir Rice case. Then you had someone else. You got a new DA, because the one in Philadelphia decided to be a corrupt, a brother, he gone, so now you got a, one there. You have, of course, Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore. You have, uh, you have uh, Fox after uh, Anita Alvarez in Cook County, Box Laquan McDonald case. Civilian so review boards is one thing. We have to also elect conscience district attorneys who are going to file the charges because even a civilian review board can't file charges against a police officer. That's also a part of it as well. And so that can so we'll put that on the list. Got it. I'm going over here with a question. I, I see you. I took care of that one. For yeah, oh, uh, all right, they, we got th look, there's, there's no question that the athletes have a phenomenal megaphone. And in a place like Oakland, for example, if Steph Curry, uh, Jermon Green, uh, Kevin uh, get together, uh, Durant get together and go down to the mayor's office and say, we want some teeth in this, we want to sit down with you, they're not gonna, the mayor's not going to tell them to get lost. Okay, so I understand the point that you're making. Yep. There's a role for all of us here. And as was stated, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tremendously uh, broad-based uh, uh, effort that has to take place. As long as we're all on the same page, most certainly the athletes have a role to play. Question. I am Chastity Neal. I'm a sports management student out of Chicago, Illinois. And my question is for research purposes, how, how are we framing this conversation? Because I'm having difficulty researching this conversation, athlete act activism and injustice with athletes. The only research I'm really finding is around the University of um, Missouri situation where they got the president fired. But how are we talking about this in the professional league as far as research? I, I know we're having this conversation now in a panel and all that, but for, as far as research for academic purposes, is how are we having this conversation? I think the research comes from different um, examples, like you just like you just mentioned. Um, you know, I'm speaking at different universities, and they're and they're using what happened, like in Missouri, um, where the athletes all got together, and they're using that to kind of show the power of athletes. Now, the school board, the school was trying to get this guy fired, the president that you're talking about, for the entire school year, and nothing was happening. So then they then they connected with the athletes. The athletes threatened, like Dr. Edwards said, threatened to boycott. For the, for the game that was coming up that Saturday. And that cat was gone in like two days. So then what needs to also happen is that organizations need to not be afraid to partner with different athletes because athletes can help move the needle. So just like um, you were saying about the athletes going down and d demanding for the mayor what they want, go down with an organization. And y'all go down together right. and demand, make that And deal. actually, actually take it further, what has happened in Missouri, not only uh, was the president gone, the, uh, the chancellor was gone, right. and they have experienced a dramatic decrease in enrollment as well as giving back to the university. Mm -hmm. So the new president uh, realizes they have to totally restart because that's had a clear economic impact on the University of Missouri. All right, question. I, I put your hand up. <laughs> 
question for Dr. Edwards. Uh, can a boycott against the NFL be justified if, in fact, any one NFL team or more has offered a position uh, to, uh, to Colin Kaepernick? And I ask that in light of the fact that uh, it's been reported by NFL insider Jason Lockenfour, amongst others, that Seattle was willing to hire Kaepernick, but his uh, salary request was too high. First of all, hold up. I can't. That's a lie. That's not true. That's an absolute lie. They did not make an offer. Uh, and I can, I'm straight up, that's a lie. No, no, no. Uh, follow me. That's a lie. If you know who I was just texting while this panel was going on, that's a lie. They did not offer a deal to him, nor did any other NFL team. Doc, go ahead. Um, Pete, um, Pete Carroll is one of our guys out of the 49ers. He's the head coach at the Seattle um, Seahawks. And long before they even brought Cap in, uh, he and I talked for about an hour. Uh, they did not offer Kaepernick a position, uh, principally because they have a starter. Um, they, uh, uh, Kaepernick and Pete's uh, judgment was a starter and he said we do not need given the other issues that we have on this team a uh, quarterback issue about who's going to start so if he had been a backup they may have uh, uh, offered him a, a, a tryout and a position but he said this guy is a straight up starter and should be starting for somebody in this league which is crystal clear I mean you watch the first two weeks of games I mean you had guys out there playing quarterback who couldn't hit their plates with their forks much less uh, Hit the uh, the the. I thought it was a replacement so, lead. So in, in in any event, in any event, uh, that is not true. He has not been inundated with offers, and nobody has. You'll know that they're serious about an offer when they bring him in uh, and actually try him out. Uh, and uh, depending upon his um, his abilities, uh, you know, money has never been an issue in. Um, um, the NFL. They're, they're, they're paying prices for wide receivers who couldn't run out of sight if you gave them all day. Uh, so so the, the issue becomes uh, Kaepernick's stand on these political concerns. And for everybody in here, please, from a, from a media standpoint, uh, do understand uh, there are stories that are written and that are purposely written that are full of lies. Uh, Jason knows, look, I've been in the business since I was 14 years old. Anytime I see a story, first of all, when it says a source said or a source familiar with the thinkings of the office mean that ain't nobody who worked for them, nobody near them. It's a lie. Uh, and so, again, we see those all the time. And so you can you can read the story and go, we know they lying, they lying, because there's no truth to it. And so uh, and that's why when the Daily Caller wrote that story, yeah, they were straight lying because they couldn't even attach. They couldn't even say it was an official with the team. It was a source familiar with. That means automatically that's a lie. All right, what's the question? Thank you. Uh, this question is for the Council for the Players Association. Earlier you mentioned that you wanted the community to um, support the players. Do you believe that the NFL bo boycott actually supports or hurts the individual players if the community is not watching the games? Um, I, I, honestly, I don't know as much about the boycott movement. I've only seen snippets of it, admittedly, on social media, so I'm not sure um, how organized it is. I, again, would not suggest boycotting NFL games as support of the players or the issues. I would um, suggest getting more involved in the community and really in agreement with everything that's been said here in terms of organizations who already have the knowledge and the platforms, partnering with players who have like minds and like perspectives to really impact change. And one of the things I would hope is that when you see people who choose not to do things with the NFL, so for instance, when Jay-Z turned the NFL down performing at the Super Bowl, I would have liked to have seen Jay-Z say, this is why I'm turning them down, which again adds fuel to the movement. Had Jay-Z said, I am not performing at the Super Bowl because of what the NFL has done to Colin Kaepernick and their inability to address police brutality in these issues, that provides far more context and it also drives the story in a different way. And what it also does is it gives other people courage. And this is the thing I think people have to understand. When one person does take a stance and then other people, when I, I keep, that's why I keep going back to the public, that also gives encouragement to the players to say, if I do this, I'm going to have some other folks who are going to have my back. Uh, and so, again, in, in any movement we've seen that actually uh, has taken place. Question. I have a question about the NCAA. We spent a lot of time talking about the NFL. What should the ask be for collegiate athletes? Okay, that's real broad. Can you like narrow that down? 
that's like really broad. It's not too broad. I mean, should, no. should, should college athletes be paid? Yeah. Now, that's, 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 now, is that what you want to address? Well, that's that, what he's asking. Right, so I, I think I'm just making sure. Yeah. That's, I know what he's asking, but that's, definitely they should be paid. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I'm proud to be a, a graduate of Syracuse University, but I know how much Syracuse University made off of me. And, you know, when you look at the numbers and you look at the, the merchandise and you look at what they're selling, they're selling your jersey. It doesn't have your name in the back, but you know that it's your number. And everybody in the arena knows that it's your number. You know, when they, they look at the TV, some of their TV contracts can rival some professional leagues. So they're making all this money. The coach gets a nice, cushy, cushy um, radio show that he gets a million dollars, gets a Nike sponsorship. They get all this money, but then they say that, 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 that the players just get the opportunity and they get to, to have their education free. And the, and, and the, and the, the money doesn't, doesn't add up. I, okay, I could say maybe 30, 40 years ago, before it was a billion-dollar industry, then maybe you could say that. But right now, the money is just too much. So, but they're not going to change unless they're made to change. The system works exactly how Mark Everett and the NCAA wants it to work. When Power and money. money. And, and they, they have the system that they want. What, what better business would you have that you don't have to pay none of your employees? They're not going to change that. That's a good We've seen that before. Right. So, so, so they're not, they're not going to change that unless they're made to change it. Right. And, and also, yeah. the Washington Post uh, actually was this week. Actually, uh, I believe it was the Washington Post. They published uh, a story on a, a poll that was taken. And you see also the racial divide. 54% of African Americans say pay college players. Only 31% of whites said pay college players. Uh, and so, so I mean, so very interesting, even when, when you see that, how people view this whole notion of a, quote, free education uh, versus paying players. I think, Dr. Edwards, you want to say something? Yeah, the, the, the Super Five conferences um, should pay their athletes in football and basketball. Uh, I mean, you can be honest when you can't be right. They're making so much money off of championship games, uh, uh, NC2A, Final Four games, and so forth and so on. They should pay the athletes who are bringing that money into those institutions and into those conferences. Now, if you are a Division III school, that's a whole different level of athletic enterprise. If, even if you're a Division II school, in some, that's a whole different level of athletic enterprise. But if you're a part of the Super Five conferences, you are essentially running professional leagues where you don't have to pay the labor that uh, uh, brings all of that money in. Uh, so yes, they should have to pay. And we should stop the dilly-dallying and hem-hawing and nonsense about amateurism when everybody is making money except the kids who produce it. So uh, that, that's a simple, straightforward. Will they do that? Not without pressure, not without a revolt, not until a group of kids yep. on two teams get into a national football playoff championship locker room and say, we will take the field when somebody comes in here and talks to us about the money. Uh, the same with regard to the Final Four. When those teams sit in the locker room and say, we will take the court when somebody comes in here and talks to us about the money, you will begin to get change because that's the language that they understand. Power and money. Question. George Rogers, Southern University, Baton Rouge. The, the CBC has an initi initiative to support HBCUs. How can we encourage black athletes who attend majority schools to support HBCUs? What do you mean by support? To go there instead? No, no. When they give a million dollars to Kentucky, give a million dollars to a black school. That's what I'm talking about financially. That, that's, a, that's a matter of um, a solicitation and convincing them that these institutions are not only uh, uh, worth saving, but imperative that they be saved in terms of their programs and so forth. And that's a job uh, that um, uh, the HBCUs have to, uh, have to undertake. Otherwise, you, you know, I, I work with professional athletes in the NBA. I've worked with them in major, I was in the Major League Baseball Commissioner's Office for um, uh, five years. I've been with the 49ers for 31 years. And to get athletes to donate money to uh, uh, e even the schools that they come from is, is an extremely challenging undertaking. Justifying it is even more difficult. Uh, as one athlete told me, 
what has the athletes that are coming in the future ever done for me? You know, I mean, so at the, at the end of the day, that's a, that's, a, that's a difficult challenge, and they're not going to do it. But, but, but hold on, but I, but I got to ask you this. Okay, you said Southern University Baton Rouge. Has Southern University Baton Rouge put together an initiative and gone to the players with the New Orleans Saints and uh, the Pelicans basketball team and presented them a proposal to say, we would like for you to support this. Has a university done that? Yes. They have? Yes. What's the proposal? I don't know the particulars of it. Okay, do this here. Email it to me. Okay. No, no, I'm dead serious. Because to Dr. Edwards' point, if the university, if you don't ask, then nobody can even consider uh, whether I want to give. I'm very curious to know if, they, if they've actually done that. So I would say start with the pro teams in your own state and then see how they respond. Some folks may give if they get asked. Okay, I want to make one comment. Yeah. No, I gotta go to the next question. Oh, I, I, look, just cause you got gray hair, don't, <laughs> don't, 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 don't try to, don't, don't, I don't care if you graduated in 1969, I was born in 1968, that don't mean nothing. You, it, it, uh, you got 20 seconds to make this comment. I'm gonna get a stopwatch, go. Some states have special challenges. Louisiana is one of them. When, where black colleges are ostracized. Okay, first of all, that is not a Louisiana issue. That's an HBCU issue in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Florida. Right now in Maryland, all the HBCUs are suing. HBCUs in Maryland right now are waiting on a federal judge's decision where they are suing the state of Maryland when it comes to funding. Mississippi, Alvin Chambliss led that lawsuit. Texas HBCUs, North Carolina, that ain't a Louisiana HBCU thing. That's a HBCU thing in America. But what I'm saying is that the initiative ought to be around trying to figure out how to make that different. No, what I need you to do is find out if Southern University of Baton Rouge has put together a specific ask of players and have they taken it to the Saints and uh, the Pelicans. Holla at me. And let me ask, let me say one last thing about this. We focus in on athletes because their salaries are published. Are we focusing in as well on lawyers and doctors and engineers and others who ought to be donating money as well? That becomes an issue. We focus in on athletes because their salaries are published. That, that's, not, that's not a good enough reason. And let me also say this here because you brought it up. Okay, and let me just be real frank. I went to Texas A&M, but I don't care. Florida A&M's graduates, only 5% give to Florida A&M. Howard University president, when he got to Howard, only 3.7% of their undergraduate graduates gave to Howard, now it's 10%. Wilberforce, their president arrived, only 1% gave, now it's 9%. And so can, HBCU grads can't ask somebody who didn't go to HBCU to give if they won't give themselves. And when I say give, I'm not saying they gave a thousand. That's only 5% of the fam giving even a nickel. That means 95% who wear Florida a and letters don't give a dime. Go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm proud to be here with my labor union, UTLA, United Teachers of Los Angeles. Um, and so my question is for everyone on the panel. What advice can you give to educators who want to engage their students in activism? I have a thing that I've cool. been pushing for years. Uh, we have to be committed to teaching our children to dream with their eyes open. You don't have to target a specific cause. You have to incite them to think critically and analytically so that the issues that come up in their lives that they see as they ride the bus to school or whatever, they can think about in a fashion that allows them to engage those issues intelligently and productively and constructively as citizens, not just of this country, but of the world. They have to be able to think. Uh, and that is the greatest thing that you can do uh, for uh, these young people, to teach them to dream with their eyes open, have dreams, but realize that the world is a very complicated and can be a very challenging and difficult place. That's the great thing that makes teaching the greatest profession in the world, unlike, unlike engineering or law or medicine uh, or dentistry, where a professional does something for somebody, you can incite students to think so that they can do for themselves. And so at the end of the day, my advice would be 
teach your young people to dream with their eyes open. And let me, and let me add to that even more specifically. Um, something that I've been doing, um, I put panel discussions together across the country. And I, I did it before with my, with my book, of Fatherhood, and Mr. Martin has been on different panels with me before. Man, I'm rolling, Mr. Martin, my daddy. Okay, well, you, said, you always say that to me. I'm <laughs> you always say that to me. I was supposed to call you Ro Ro. I don't call you Mr. Martin. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Only women and children can call me Uncle Ro. I'm saying, I call you Mr. Martin. You call me Ro. <laughs> But, but so, so what I'm doing now, my next book is called We Matter, Athletes and Activism. And I've, I've interviewed a lot of different athletes, Dr. Harry Edwards in, in, included, you know, and D. Wade and Carmelo Anthony and Bill Russell and Kareem. And I'm going to be putting panel discussions together talking about this very same thing. So what I did during, um, during All-Star Weekend in, in New York, I went to Harlem. And I connected with the um, education board there. And they brought 2,500 young black and Latino men to one location. And we talked about fatherhood. So now. This coming up, um, All Star Weekend, I can talk to you after this. Um, I'm going to be doing the same thing in LA. All Star Weekend is in LA. That's why we said LA. So, so I want to do the same thing where I have a panel discussion of athletes and activism, and we're encouraging younger athletes to be able to use their voice and use the power of their voice. Because a lot of times, you know, even at a high school level, you say something in high school in your town and things like that, you have a lot of strength. You, you could, you, uh, different things that you want done. You know what I mean? You say you have the, you have the media that is, that is right at your disposal. You know, you have the newspapers that are right at your disposal. You know, you speak and people will listen. So I want to encourage younger athletes to be able to use their voice. So make sure that we talk afterwards because I'm putting together a panel discussion in L.A. for All-Star Weekend in February. Uh, just to back up what he said, uh, in East St. Louis, my hometown, East St. Louis, Illinois, uh, uh, t uh, last week, a junior high school team, the whole football team, yep. took a knee in, 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 uh, against a uh, uh, police uh, uh, killing. And it's been headlines in the newspapers and in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch uh, every day since then. So uh -oh. even at that level, athletes uh, have a substantial mm -hmm. megaphone. And what the brother here is doing is saying, you have to use it intelligently. Uh, right. Also, to, to add to that, uh, we often talk about Yesterday, Jim Lawson was in this room who uh, led the Nashville movement. Uh, one of our, a, a, a living legend, a giant. Uh, and I think one of the mistakes that we make when we talk about civil rights movement, black freedom movement, we talk about speeches and events, but we completely ignore uh, the, the teaching and the training that existed. The Nashville movement was all teaching and training. They did not, Freedom Riders did not walk outside a door unless they were taught and trained. Uh, right now, uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. William Barber, who heads the North Carolina NAACP State Conference, um, he, he, is, he is picking up Dr. King's uh, Poor People's Campaign. And they've been traveling around the country. All they've been doing is organizing and mobilizing and teaching and building. And so just, uh, what was this, yesterday, uh, so they, they were in L.A., they expected 500, 1,000 showed up. They had 52,000 people who were on the phone line. Uh, three, uh, they were trended, over 300 signed up saying they would be willing to do a season of agenda-based civil disobedience at the join with others from states. Uh, and they're gonna soon, uh, he said, they did a deep dive training with 15 other anchor organizations. And they're going to Arizona, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Virginia, and Illinois. They are mobilizing whites. They, they, I mean, they got, they got poor whites who are showing up at these events. And so that's the other piece. I think we make a mistake when we, we talk about activism, but we ignore the training of activism. We talk about the event, not the training. So part of that is really focused on that. And I would say when you th in, in, we think about Dr. King, they were, they were extremely strategic in their, in their training and teaching. Come on, stand on up. Thank you, Alpha brother. Um, my question, I'm a pastor, and I, I worked at Howard for more than 30 years. But my, my question is, is there any collective activism on the part of the church? Uh, there's an infringement of sports on the church. The people see sports as gods, goddesses, and- but The NFL did take Sunday. Yeah, they have, that's my point. They're taking Sunday. But we have hands on with the people. And then follow up to what, uh, Roland is saying, we, we're, we're ready reservoirs for athletes to come in if we can get that kind of connection to get the community together in the church, have an ethic 
Because a lot of sports is without ethic. People just go in to get the money. But then they don't even know how to spend it. So what, in terms of working collaboratively with churches who have a moral, ethical bent to it that uh, we, can, we can do? Because we ready Freddy. I mean, we, I, I, I was president of an organization with over 200 pastors, and I know their hearts. But it's just that how do we get them together where we can bring the athletes in, which will draw the persons who don't come to church, don't have anything else, mm -hmm. because they're false god or goddesses of money, where we can have some training and some discussions. Nah, see, I got, I got to give you some pushback on that. I got to give you some pushback on that before I go to the panel. This is the first time in the history, in 398 years, since the first uh, 20 odd Africans arrived here in 1619, that there's been a movement that has involved black people that the church is not leading. This is the Black Lives Matter church. Many church leaders were absent because they did not agree with certain individuals in their backgrounds. Uh, and so part of the problem here, and this is, this is the church is going to have to deal with this. Can the church for the first, can the black church for the first time follow and not lead? I, I, I think that before you follow, you got to have a course. And what I'm suggesting, this is a struggle and a battle between uh, Loose, uh, loose values without any concentric understanding of what is valuable. And I, See, I, I got to disagree with y'all. I got to be pushed back on that. <laughs> I fundamentally believe that if the church, if church churches locally, if they mobilize and organize, if I'm an athlete, I see that, then I will come to you. But if the church is waiting for an athlete to come and then they say we'll do something, then y'all gonna be waiting. Okay, okay, let me let me let me go can, from my can I, specific. Can I say one thing? Well, of I'm agreeing with you though. I'm agreeing with you because okay. I've worked with the I, churches. I got pushed back on that. But listen, I've worked with the churches. Okay, so so when I did my fatherhood book, I specifically went to the churches to do all of my panel discussions. Yep. The, the panel that we did yes. was in Greater, Greater Mount Calvary. Yep. I'm a member of First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. All right. I do my, my panels across the country with the churches. Now, I have some good experiences in some other churches that you couldn't pay me to go back to, to be quite honest. And it, now, sometimes I come to churches and there's a certain level of uncomfortability that they have in dealing with activism. Now, now it's by church by church basis. I'm not going to say the black church because not all black churches think of and, and act the same way. You know, so I have had some good relationships with the churches, good and bad relationships. I would love to come to your church and do a panel and have young people, young people, all right, because my focus is with young people. I love coming here and speaking to the Congressional Black Caucus and talking to all y'all, but my focus is with young people. There's some young people in here. I'm talking about, I want to see If y'all 30 and under, stand up. I want to 30 hold. and under, hold on, Eton. 30 <laughs> and under, stand up. Some of y'all lying. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm just Eton. Go ahead. So when I say young people, I want to talk to high school and college. I want to talk to the snake crowd. That's who I want to talk to, and that's who I want to work with. And sometimes some of the elders don't want to have the young people involved, and that goes for the NAACP. That goes. That goes for the churches. That goes for all the different organizations that I. And I'm speaking personally for me. So one of the things that needs to happen is that the the churches need to be open to having young people and listening to them instead of just trying to guide them all the way. Because it has to be a two-way street. So you listen and then you guide, but you have to be able to listen first. But in this period in 2017 of movements, the things that are happening, I can tell you because I'm dealing with them constantly on my show, and that is many churches are on the sidelines because they are not leading. And what I'm saying is if the pastors you talked about if they have developed activism vehicles and then they are out there doing the work, I can tell you, I know for a fact in Chicago, athletes were aligning with Reverend James Meeks because they saw him out there doing the work when it comes to education. In Baltimore, Reverend Jamal Bryan, Freddie Haynes in Dallas, Jeffrey Johnson in Indianapolis, uh, Pastor Jenkins in uh, First Baptist Glen Art in Maryland. It's happening, but the church has to create the activism vehicle first and then the folks say, now I'm, now I'm going to roll with you. 